What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Tan Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. And we have a lot of volleyball to get into today, and we have lots to recap, such as the New Jersey Freedom. They continue to roll in the NBA. How did they do in event number three? And how did all the other teams do? We had some teams getting their first win of the 2022 NBA season. Finally! Also, the ABP had the New Orleans Open this past weekend. Which pairs came out on top? And how about Loyola of Chicago hiring its new men's volleyball coach? Who is this new men's volleyball coach? And is it a home run? And we have a big commitment coming from a class of 2023 high school girls volleyball player. Where did she commit to? And who is this girl? Hand me a volleyball. It's that for that. Because I'm about to sit and serve you up all the volleyball action here on Set Point. This is Tara Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on iSports Radio. Your direct feed for all about a sport. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point. I hope you all are having a great Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Monday, whatever, whenever you are listening from. Just want to wish everyone a happy Memorial Day. Thank you to all that have served. Thank you to all that have made the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you to everyone that helped make this country continue to go round. I hope you all are having a great day, and I hope you all are just kicking back, relaxing, and unwinding for the day. Hopefully you all didn't have to work like I did. Woo, Nelly. It was a long day for me, but it's all good. I'm here now, ready to give you all that delicious volleyball action. But first and foremost, we have a word from our sponsor. iSports Radio is proud to call the Southern California Warriors semi-pro football team the official sponsor of iSports Radio. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get filmed and trapped for professional teams, big-time colleges, or just playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get the second chance you've been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow them on Twitter at SoCal Warriors, on Instagram at Southern California underscore Warriors, and on Facebook by typing in the word Southern, then California, then Warriors. iSports Radio is available on Twitter and on Instagram at iSports Radio, and on Facebook by typing in the word IE, then Sports, then Radio. They also have a website, www.iesportsradio.com, and when you go there, you will see a Patreon link with five different tiers, with the first one starting off at $5 a month. This will get you a shout-out from all 31 of our shows, and higher tiers will include iSports Radio merchandise, access to IESRU, the podcasting university of iSports Radio, and a chance to be featured on iSports Radio's flagship show, The Defining Moment with Larry B. Because for the past eight years, iSports Radio has been bringing you amazing content, ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel, to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports cities around the country. All the while, we've been continued to be by the fans and for the fans. And with your help, we are ready to take the next biggest step. Thank you to everyone for continuing to make iSports Radio your direct feed for all that sports. Shout out to our four Patreon supporters, Bay Area Raised Apparel, Marcus Losgrate, Key to the Gate, and an anonymous supporter. Also, big shout out to iSports Radio's Fan of the Month, Justin Ekstrom. His Twitter is at the sport, the sports crib 21 he is a Minnesota Vikings fan hailing from Minnesota. He's also good friends with the sports governor himself, 
Vince Wright, and he's also a proud supporter of 7th Street Pizza in Minnesota. Also, we'd like to give a shout to everyone who helped make iSports Radio's 8th year anniversary super duper special. We hope to have many more where that came from, and here's to many more to come. Now let's get on into the volleyball action. Big shout to the chat room. Larry B says, what's up, Taryn? He also says, let's go, Matadors. Well, let's just say the Inland Empire Matadors kind of had a weekend to forget. Adam Karnick's also in the chat room. He says, "He, what do the Untouchables need to do to improve? I'll be getting into that a little bit later. Andrew Hegelbaugh says, what's going on, Taryn? I'm at work right now, so I just want to pop in and say hello. Have a great show. Hey, have a great day at work. Hope you're... Have hope it goes by quick and Mike Pat says have a great have a great show, Taryn. Thank you. So I also will be having my what if moment because this week is is what if week on at IE Sports Radio and I have a couple of what if moments in NCAA volleyball and I have a what if moment when it comes to something outside of the court when it comes to volleyball. But it's not too personal. So Before we get into all of the NVA or AVP action, we actually have some schedule releases to go over. As Pierre Moss just popped in the chat room, he says, have a great show, my friend. Thank you. So let's get on into the schedule releases. So we'll start off with the full schedule release when it comes to the NCAA women's volleyball schedule. We'll start off with North Carolina. So North Carolina released its schedule for the 2022 season Last week, they kick off the season on August 26th against Colorado State in Fort Collins, Colorado. And then they also play UC Santa Barbara and Northern Colorado in Greeley, Colorado, following that Colorado State match. Then North Carolina heads back home to take on South Carolina in the Battle of the Carolinas at Chapel Hill. And then... The day after, they will remain home to take on Arizona. And then on the September 6th, they'll head down to Charlotte, North Carolina, to take on the University of Charlotte. And then they'll head back to Chapel Hill for a two-game homestand against the Michigan schools, Michigan State and Michigan. Now, those Michigan matchups are going to be really big right there. Those are probably going to be their early test. And the Santa Barbara one is also sneaky good. And then South Carolina is also a great matchup just because South Carolina, they made the NCAA tournament. Michigan made the NCAA tournament. Michigan State hails from the Big Ten. Arizona can also be sneaky good as well. Then North Carolina heads on the road to Virginia to take on Old Dominion. Then they have VCU that same day on September 16th. And then they close out their non-conference schedule September 17th against UMBC. Then right off the bat, North Carolina kicks off their ACC conference schedule against Pitt at Pitt. So they're going to head down to Yinzerland to take on the Pittsburgh Panthers. Then they'll also remain on the road at Charlottesville, Virginia to take on Virginia. Then they'll return home on September 30th to take on Miami, which is another NCAA tournament team. And then October 2nd, North Carolina will take on Florida State. Then on October 7th, they actually have a double header. I'm actually reading this, and it looks like North Carolina has a double header, which I, that's a rarity right there. I don't know why <laughs> North Carolina has a double header, but I don't know if that's a schedule scheduling error, but either way, they have two games on October 7th. They have Virginia Tech, and they also have Wake Forest. Then they have Boston College the week after. Then they have Syracuse on October 16th. Then on October 19th and October 23rd, they are on the road to take on NC State and Duke when it comes to those North Carolina rivals. Then on October 28th, North Carolina heads back to Chapel Hill to take on Georgia Tech. Then October 30th, North Carolina takes on Clemson. Then November 4th, North Carolina heads down to South Bend to take on Notre Dame. Then November 6th, North Carolina heads down to Louisville to take on those Cardinals, the reigning ACC champs. Then they actually have a two-game series against North Carolina, except the second game will be a week after, and this time it will be at Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Then on November 18th, North Carolina heads down to the Sunshine State, the other Sunshine State, to take on Florida State. Then North Carolina closes out the season at home against Duke and Virginia. So looking at this North Carolina schedule, 
Uh, they have some challenging matches. First of all, their ACC schedule is loaded. They obviously have to play Louisville twice. That's going to be brutal right there. They have to play Pitt right off the bat. They play Florida State twice. My goodness. Boston College, eh, Boston College might be a challenge for them. Notre Dame might be improved, though they lost quite a bit of players. Georgia Tech is going to be a challenge. I think North Carolina can possibly, hence the word possibly, make do with the schedule. If they can get as many wins as they did last year in their non-conference schedule, they could have a good enough cushion to make the NCAA tournament. Because last season, they won all their non-conference games, and they eventually wound up... They finished above 500 when it came to their ACC schedule, and they eventually made the NCAA tournament when they ultimately fell to Tennessee in the first round. So overall, North Carolina has a challenging schedule when it comes to their non-conference schedule, and then the ACC just makes things a lot tougher, especially when you're playing Louisville twice in the span of seven days. Oof. And then, like I said, right off the bat, they're facing Pitt to open up their their conference schedule. And then they have Miami, which is obviously a good team, and the list goes on and on. So the entire ACC has improved, with maybe the lone exception of Notre Dame. But overall, I think North Carolina, as long as they take care of the matches they're supposed to win, they should be fine. I don't know if they'll go undefeated in non-conference play like they did last year, but I think they have that good potential. I think North Carolina is a great team that nobody should be sleeping on. Larry B. says, I'm just going to say the NVA is awesome. I totally agree, Larry. I'll be getting into the NVA probably toward the end of the show, Jumping on over to the next schedule release, we have Florida releasing its schedule for the SEC. They released their entire schedule, which, boy howdy, we're already getting some of the Power 5 conference teams releasing their schedule. And I think that's great because I really can't wait to see what this Florida team has to offer. Because I thought they left a lot on the table last season. But that's just me. So their first matchup is against ETSU. They will be at home against at home against ETSU in Gainesville, Florida. Then they'll also play North Florida on August 26th, which is basically the student welcome weekend. Then the day after, they will be playing East Tennessee State, which it's not really the most outstanding, challenging schedule, but it'll do for Florida. And then also, Florida will play Virginia to cap off their four-game homestand in the past, in those two days. Honestly, I think Florida should be able to mow down those four teams. They should be able to mow down North Florida, East Tennessee State, and Virginia. And I guess they're only playing three matches. I miscounted. They're playing North Florida, East Tennessee, and Virginia. Then Florida's schedule starts to pick up as August 30th, they... They remain home in Gainesville as they welcome Stanford into the fray. Now, that is going to be a great matchup right there just because it's the battle of two NCAA tournament teams. And honestly, I would not be surprised if Florida and Stanford went five sets. Both those teams have a lot of talent. They still have some talent. Like, Florida lost more talent than Stanford. But I could already say that Stanford is going to be really good. But I think Florida could withstand its own despite losing quite a bit of plays to graduation and whatnot. And then that same week, to end the week, on September 4th, Florida hits the road to Minneapolis to take on the Minnesota Gophers. I'll be getting into that matchup a little bit later, but that's going to be another great matchup right there. SEC versus Big Ten. That's really going to be a matchup to watch for that week. And then they also have the Sunshine Invitational as September 9th, They will be playing Georgia Southern in a nice little Southern hospitality matchup. Then that same day, they actually play Florida Gulf Coast. Now, that Florida Gulf Coast matchup could be a sneaky good matchup. One, because Florida Gulf Coast made the NCAA tournament, and they actually won an NCAA tournament game. And then two, it's an interstate rivalry match. Like, I love in-state rivalry matches, and I think that could be a sneaky good matchup right there. And you never know with Florida Gulf Coast. Like, they are they don't get a good enough rap just because they're a non-Power 5 team, unlike Florida. So I think that is a matchup to kind of keep your eyes peeled for. 
And then on Saturday, September 10th, Florida takes on VCU. I'm pretty sure Florida will be able to handle VCU. I'm not trying to bash VCU, but I just think Florida is just too perennially good. Gina, Gina G, or Gina Rep in the debate, pops in the chat room. She says, have an awesome show. Best volleyball show on the planet. Sorry, I've been absent. No worries, Gina. I know you're still over the moon about your Golden State Warriors making the NBA Finals, so there's that. Your support for Set Point does not go unnoticed, so I'm just saying, Gina, you're, 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 you're totally good. Back to Florida, they head on they, – they still remain in Gainesville, Florida on September 13th to take on Florida State. Now that is going to be a great matchup right there. Florida State versus Florida is always a great matchup. And I'm just going to also say, last year Florida State won this matchup, and I'm pretty sure Florida is going to want a little revenge. Now, we don't know how good Florida State is going to be just because Florida State is, you know, they've been, they lost a few to graduation and whatnot. But honestly, I think Florida State and Florida is going to be a great matchup. Adam says he wants to know about the new Loyola men's volleyball coach. I'll get to that after this little segment of schedule releases. So heading on down to September 16th, Florida hits the road to Madison, Wisconsin to take on the reigning NCAA champion, Wisconsin. Very good matchup right there. It's the battle of two teams that kind of got hit hard in graduation as Florida really got hit hard in terms of graduation while Wisconsin returns a good core of its players, including Anna Smrek, the most outstanding player from last year's NCAA tournament. So Florida's going to have its hands full against Wisconsin. So don't be surprised if they take an L, but I feel Florida might give Wisconsin a decent battle. The time is to be determined, and yeah. So Florida kicks off SEC play on Wednesday, September 21st against Alabama as Alabama in most in the most recent years hasn't really been good, so I'm pretty sure Florida should be able to handle them. My big concern, however, is their two matches after, as Florida hits the road to Columbia to take on South Carolina. Now, when it comes to South Carolina, they always seem to find a way to pull off that big upset in the SEC. Whether it's against Kentucky or Florida, South Carolina always seems to find a way to pull off that big Upset as we welcome Davidson Crooks into the chat room. He says, "What's good?" Just discussing Florida's women's volleyball schedule. I'm actually at the SEC portion, so you actually just pop by really quickly. Um, no offense to the Alabama to Alabama fans on what I just said previously, just because Davidson is kind of a Bama fan, but I digress. So back to South Carolina. That South Carolina Florida series is going to be really good. I would not be surprised to see Florida and South Carolina duke it out in a pair of barn burners in Columbia. Florida remains on the road on October 5th on a Wednesday to take on Tennessee. Now, Tennessee obviously is a very good team. They made the round of 32 last year. They have a lot of good players that they're returning. They got a couple good transfers coming in. I think Florida and Tennessee is going to be a barn burner, especially since this is going to be at Knoxville. Florida's going to really have to play it, bring its A game to the table against the Lady Vols. But I think Florida should be able to handle them. They played a decent enough challenging schedule, and they're coming off of two big matches against South Carolina. So I really think Tennessee should be able to... I I don't know if they'll pull out the win, but don't sleep on Florida when it comes to this matchup. So then Florida ske- Florida's like schedule continues to get a little tough, but this time it gets a little bit lighter as they return home to Gainesville to take on LSU on October 8th and 9th. So that's actually going to be camp reunion night, which... That's actually going to be on a Sunday. It's also their Sunday fun day match. But I think Florida should handle LSU quite well. Florida is just too good when it comes to the – when it comes to facing LSU. And LSU is going to probably be hit, get, getting hit hard when it comes to graduation and whatnot. And then Florida has another – yes, another challenging – road series as they head down to Starksville or Starkville to take on Mississippi State on October 14th and 15th. So that Florida Mississippi State match is going to be a very good matchup. Mississippi State had themselves an outstanding year last year, finishing second in the SEC, which is their highest they've ever finished. 
And if Mississippi State is as good as they are last year, I think Florida could be in for a big battle with the re- – with no, not I'm thinking of Ole Miss. Uh, the Aggies. I think Mississippi State is known as the Aggies. But either way, Mississippi State is going to be a big challenge for Florida, especially since Florida is going to be having quite a bit of young players and quite a bit of returning players from last year. I really think Florida can at least take one off of Mississippi State. It all depends on which Florida comes out to play. And then Florida, the schedule starts to lighten up a little bit in their next two matchups as October 19th, which is a Wednesday, Florida returns home to take on Georgia. My only concern for the Georgia matchup is if could Georgia possibly pull off an upset. Just like South Carolina, Georgia always seems to sneak away with a win over an SEC team, a very good SEC team at that, and Florida was no exception. Georgia even beat Kentucky a couple seasons ago. So to me, I don't think Florida should be able to should sleep on Georgia that much. I really think Florida should be able to handle Georgia. I don't I don't know any I don't haven't heard any recent big time players committing to Georgia, but we'll see. Then Florida gets a week off and heads back to action on October 26th, which is also a Wednesday at Auburn. That should be a Fairly manageable matchup for Florida. I don't think they will. They should lose that matchup, in my opinion. Then they get another interesting matchup on October 29th and 30th as they have their two-game series against Arkansas. That will be an interesting matchup right there. Arkansas always... they As of recent, Arkansas has been decent. Last year, they finished in the first four out. So I'm pretty sure Arkansas is going to want to get at least one big win over Florida. If they get a win on the road, then that would be huge. But I think Florida handles Arkansas in both matches. Then November 4th, Florida takes on Missouri in Gainesville. They should be able to handle Missouri quite well. Missouri is still rebuilding after having graduated quite a bit of players from a couple seasons ago. Then on November 12th, which shows eight days after their previous matchup, Florida hits the road to College Station to take on Texas A&M. Now, Texas A&M kind of lost a few players to graduation in the transfer portal, but I really think Florida should be able to handle this matchup. Texas A&M is nowhere near as good as they were back in 2019. Let's get that out of the way. I think Florida handles Texas A&M quite nicely. And then on November 19th and 20th, this is the probably the big matchup of the SEC. Kentucky remains at home or stays at home to take on – or, yeah, Florida stays at home to take on Kentucky, which is going to be a huge, 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 huge matchup. My only qualm with both Kentucky matches is why is Florida having its senior night against Kentucky? Now, I understand that could be for more motivation for the seniors – but it could be for more bulletin board material for Kentucky, considering you're putting Kentucky, you're making Kentucky your senior night. You normally want to have your senior night against a team you probably know you're going to beat, or just maybe against a rival. I don't know. I mean, I guess Florida and Kentucky are like the closest thing to rivals, but Kentucky is perennially good, and they've owned the SEC throughout most of the past, so. I hope Florida is able to bring its A game on its senior night, so they'll have to. And then Florida closes out the season on November 25th and 26th against Ole Miss in Oxford. So Ole Miss had a decent season, but I can still see Florida just dominating Ole Miss. I think the Rebels have improved, but Florida is just too perennially good. It is going to be on the road, so Ole Miss has that advantage, but I think... Florida ultimately comes out on top. So that is that for the Florida schedule. Now closing out the schedule breakdowns is the Minnesota non-conference schedule release. Now I'm just going to say this. Remember when Ohio State released its non-conference schedule? Well, Minnesota released its non-conference schedule, and it also went down the path of scheduling really tough. So just going to get this out of the way. Minnesota's non-conference schedule is again has eight count them eight 
NCAA teams. And they were all, all eight of those teams made the NCAA tournament. They kick off the season in the Big Ten, Big 12 challenge against Baylor. Um, I'm not entirely sure who is the host school of that Big Ten, Big yeah, Big Ten, Big Twelve challenge, but honestly, I want to say it's Texas A and M. Not entirely certain, but either or not Texas A and M, uh, TCU. But either way, it, it is going to be TCU. So yeah, I just confirmed it is at TCU. So Big Ten, Big Twelve challenge is going to be hosted by TCU. The first matchup is going to be Minnesota versus Baylor, which I think it's going to be a very good matchup. It's a rematch of last year's Sweet 16 matchup between the Bears and the Gophers. I really think that's going to be a fun matchup right there, and I really think that could boil down to another five-set thriller. Now, Minnesota obviously lost quite a bit to graduation, including Stephanie Samity, but I really think that Baylor... Baylor and Minnesota could still have a great matchup. And I think Minnesota could come out on top. I'm not trying to make any promises, but I think Minnesota still has that potential. And then the day after Minnesota plays the host TCU in the Big Ten Big 12 Challenge on August 27th. And then also they'll ha- they'll have their own little Big Ten Big 12 Challenge outside of the Big Ten Big 12 Challenge. As on on August 31st, Minnesota will be hitting the road to take on the University of Texas, which, boy howdy, that's going to be a huge matchup right there. And you know what they say, everything in Texas is bigger, including the competition. So they're all, right off the bat, they're facing three NCAA teams from one of the Power 5 schools, the Big 12. Now, I already mentioned this on the Florida schedule. Minnesota will be playing Florida on September 4th at Minnesota. I think it's going to be a great matchup. It's the battle of two rebuilding teams. I think Minnesota can come out on top, but you never know with Florida. Florida is kind of that heads or tails team. Sometimes they'll come out ready to go, and then sometimes they'll just kind of wince away from the competition. So... I really think it's going to be an interesting matchup. Again, it's the battle of rebuilding team versus for rebuilding team versus rebuilding team. I just think Minnesota has a little bit more firepower. Following that matchup, Minnesota has the Big Ten Pac-12 challenge. As September 9th, Minnesota will be hosting the Big Ten Pac-12 challenge against Oregon on Friday, September 9th. Going to be a great matchup right there. Oregon made the NCAA tournament even though they lost in the first round. Oregon always has a great team year in and year out with the lone exception of the 2019 season. Either way, I think Oregon-Minnesota is going to be a great matchup. Following that matchup, the day after, Minnesota will be hosting Stanford in the Big Ten Pac-12 Challenge. Going to be a great matchup. Last year, Minnesota got the better of Stanford not once, but twice. And that's probably going to be still fresh in the minds of Stanford. So I think Stanford's going to come in with some motivation. I think it's still going to be a barn burner in my opinion. I really think that Minnesota has what it takes to take down Stanford. But I like Stanford in this matchup. It's a little early for me to say that, but I like Stanford in that matchup. I think Stanford returns quite a bit of its key players like Kendall Kipp and... And what's uh, the the setter? The setter that I know that went to Redondo Union. Cammy Miner. That's her name. Cammy Miner, the the daughter of Harold Miner. How how could I forget that? <laughs> so yeah, I think Stanford returns a good chunk of its players, and I think they'll be rare to go against Minnesota. And like I said, they'll have that motivating factor when it comes to last year's matchups. Minnesota then hosts the Diet Coke Classic in the Maturi Pavilion, starting on September 15th against Pepperdine. Pepperdine made the NCAA tournament last year. They lost in the first round to UCF, or Central Florida. Either way, I think it's going to be a sneaky good matchup. Pepperdine doesn't get a good rap just because, like most of the other non-Power 5 teams, they're not a Power 5 team. But I think Pepperdine is kind of making themselves a brand. They're trying to make themselves be more out there. And I think 
Pepperdine scheduled themselves in the Maturi or the Diet Coke Classic just because they need that stiff competition for when they get in the West Coast Conference play. As for Minnesota, I think they should not underestimate Pepperdine. I think Pepperdine has a good team. They have a good plethora of returning players and incoming freshmen. I think Pepperdine and Minnesota could be a sneaky good matchup between non-Power 5 versus Power 5. And then closing out the Diet Coke Classic on September 17th, Minnesota will take on Washington State. Washington State, I want to say, won an NCAA tournament game. I'd have to double-check. But Washington State does return a good chunk of its players. I really think Washington State is one of the more forgotten about teams in the Pac-12 just because you've got your Washingtons, your UCLA's, your USC's, your everything. And then you got Washington State who it flies under the radar posting upset wins in the Apple Cup and then against UCLA and then against Utah. I think Washington State and Minnesota is going to be a very sneaky good matchup. Battle of two Power 5 conference, conference teams and I really think that both these teams Will be able, could probably play a five set match. I can assure you, it's probably not going to be a sweep for either team. I really think Minnesota and Washington State could go the distance. We'll see. So that's that for the Minnesota schedule. Just a fair reminder: Minnesota scheduled all NCAA tournament teams from last season on their schedule. Every team that's a non that's on their non conference schedule made the NCAA tournament. And that is huge just because Ohio State did that for their non-conference schedule. And you want to know what's after non-conference schedule for Minnesota and Ohio State? Big Ten conference play. And anything can happen in Big Ten conference play. Every team is going to be raring to go. There's not going to be an easy night when it comes to the Big Ten. I really think Minnesota did a great job when it comes to filling out their non-conference schedule. And I really think Minnesota really hit a home run when it came to these non-conference matches. The only way it could have gotten better is, heaven knows, they could have gotten UCLA into the fray, but I can't be mad with this slate. So that is going to do it for the the schedule releases for the NCAA women's volleyball teams. Because Adam wanted to wanted me to talk about the new Loyola men's volleyball coach, let's do it. So Loyola just recently hired their new men's volleyball coach. They hired him on Friday. So Loyola named their new head coach. Can we get a drum roll, please? John Hawks is the new Loyola men's volleyball coach. As he is a veteran coach as... He was actually named the AV, the 2022 AVCA Assistant Coach of the Year. He actually came from UCLA as a recruiting coordinator. As the athletic director Steve Watson said, we couldn't be happier to welcome John to Loyola. He is a proven winner, an elite recruiter, and has achieved excellence at each of the stops in his coach in his coaching career. We are confident that John will continue to build on the winning tradition in our men's volleyball program. So Larry B. actually asked, what's his resume look like? Well, as I just allotted to, he was the AVCA Division One and Two Assistant Coach of the Year. That is huge right there. And he spent the last seven seasons at UCLA leading the Bruins in offensive and recruiting efforts. And more, mo- most recently, John Hawks was a driving force behind UCLA's unit that hit 374 this past season. Remember, UCLA came one set away from advancing to the NCAA National Championship. Unfortunately, they just could not pull out that fifth set against Long Beach State. So, a statement from John Hawks. First of all, I would like to extend a huge thank you to Athletics Director Steve Watson and Deputy Athletics Director Holly Strauss. Holly Strauss O'Brien for truly believing in me and trusting me to lead the Loyola Men's Volleyball Program. Their vision for Loyola Athletics drew me in, and having had the opportunity to meet the wonderful staff and coaches there convinced me that this was the place for me and my family. He also also gave a thank you to John Spara, the head men's volleyball coach at UCLA, for his support and guidance. And he also said he, he also thanked his wife and his daughters, and he says he can't wait to begin his next chapter of Loyola 
volleyball. And during his tenure at UCLA, UCLA had a 134-54 and record with John Hawks as an assistant coach. And he also recruited and developed five AVCA All-Americans in the MPSF. So, honestly, this is a definite home run hire. And he also was an assistant coach at Long Beach State, UC, UC Irvine, and USC, helping the Anteaters to make the Final Four back in 2006. So, overall, I really think this is a definite home run. I, that's why I said on Friday, that amazing hire. That's the tweet right there. Like, Loyola could not have hired a better coach. And Adam is liking what he's hearing. And he says, so why was he available? Can Loyola really be a step up from UCLA? So, for John Hawks, I think he just wanted a head coaching gig just because – Probably because of the money, and you know, maybe he just wanted to make himself be well known as a head coach. I'm not entirely sure of why he left UCLA, but honestly, he's too. I feel he's kind of too good to be an assistant coach. I think he should be a head coach, and I think he made the right decision. So, I really think he gets his own program. I really think he gets to definitely be tested when it comes to coaching Loyola, a team that had aspirations of making the the conference its own conference tournament and winning its own regular season conference schedule and possibly be making the NCAA tournament. But I think it is a step up from UCLA because it's a great challenge because when it comes to UCLA, I don't think John Sparrow is going anywhere. Like John Sparrow would have to step down immensely or something big would have to happen to John Spra to have him step down from his positioning at UCLA. So I think John Hawks gets to spread his wings, become his own man and lead his own program. And I think that's huge right there. And every assistant coach has to goes through that when it comes to their own assistant coach career. And I think Hawks is going to do great things for Loyola. And I really think this is definitely going to be big time for the Ramblers. And Loyola has a good squad that they are returning. They return Cole Schlothauer. They return Ben Montplaisir. Andrew Lyons returns. And they have quite a bit of players that are returning. The only concern and question mark will be who are they going to replace Garrett Zolg with. But they do have Parker Van Buren, who is a redshirt freshman. And then they have another they have a good plethora of young talent. I really think that this team has quite a bit of potential for next year. They're also getting a good recruiting class, which includes a couple from California. So I think Will of Chicago is going to have is I think they're gonna be fine. I think this year was just one of those years where I don't think anybody predicted Purdue of Fort Wayne to just come out of the blue and just start pulling upset after upset under the rug from so many of these teams. And this was such a weird year in the NCAA men's volleyball world. Like, I don't think anyone predicted the wackiness that happened. I don't think anyone predicted Penn State losing in its conference tournament in the semifinals. I don't think anyone predicted Penn State getting left out of the NCAA tournament. I don't think anyone predicted Loyola to lose in the semifinals of its conference tournament. And I really think that this next year is going to be an interesting year for Loyola, and they have the potential for dubious immortality. That's my little spiel right there for Loyola men Chicago. I really think John Hawks is a great hire for Loyola, and I think he could possibly get more recruits, not just from Chicago, but from all over the world. Like, even California kids are committing to Loyola of Chicago, and that speaks to high volumes when it comes to their commitments, considering they could choose UCLA, they could choose USC, Long Beach State, or any of those, but they chose Loyola of Chicago just because it has a good culture, they have had a winning NCAA men's volleyball tradition, and more importantly, I just think they have a great little, they have a solid little program. It's not well known just because they're not like, they're not like, you know, big time like those Long Beach State's, the Hawaii's, and nobody could be like UCLA because UCLA is the godfather when it comes to NCAA men's volleyball. I hate to say it, but UCLA is the godfather when it comes to UC when it comes to men's volleyball. So, 
Overall, I think that Loyola men's Chicago is going to be fine for next season. And I really think that Loyola men's volleyball fans should be excited for this. So that is kind of going to do it for my discussion of Loyola men's volleyball coach John Hawks being appointed as the new head coach. I do feel bad for the other coach as his contract was not renewed and I wish that other coach the best, but things happen for a reason. And personal, personally, I think that everything everything happens for a reason. And I think that Mark Hulse will come back, will be back as a head coach for another team or an assistant coach. Like Mark Hulse is too good of a of a coach to not be coming back. The only thi- the only thing is is that last year kind of was an underwhelming finish for Loyola of Chicago. I really think that Loyola could have had a better finish outside well, not outside of its conference schedule, but I'm just saying they could have finished everything strong. They should have won its final game of the regular season against Ohio State, which could have given them the number 1 seed of the MVC conference tournament. And then they also could have won their matchup against Purdue Fort Wayne, the sixth seed. And had they done so, they would have po- they would have possibly had a better season. And who knows? Maybe Mark Holtz keeps his job. So, I, I and I'm I meant to say M I V A, not M V C. I'm thinking of another conference tournament, but at the M I V A tournament. It's been a it's been a while since I've discussed NCAA men's volleyball, but M I V A tournament. So. All right, so that's going to officially do it for Lilla of Chicago Men's Volleyball Talk. So we're going to jump into a big commitment that happened a couple weeks ago, and we'll take ourselves a nice little commercial breaky break. So when it came to this commit, this commit came from a 2023 high school girls volleyball recruit, and she actually is one of the top players in the class of 2023. Her name is Mele Coral Blagojevic. She plays at Redondo Union High School. She's one of those top premier players from from the what is it? The nation from the class of 2023. Yeah, the class of 2023. And I really think that Mele has a lot of potential. I've really seen her play. She has a cannon for a serve and she has a heavy arm. I really think she is going to do big things, and her senior year of high school is going to be a huge one. But before she gets into her senior year of high school, she actually made her commitment. So, Mele Coral Blagojevic, if I'm probably saying that correctly, hopefully. If not, then I apologize. She will be committing to... Can we get a drum roll, please? Mele Coral Blagojevich will be committing to committing to All right, I'm just drawing out the suspense. Mele Coral Blagojevich will be committing to play college volleyball and continue her studies at the University of Oklahoma. Yeah. She posted her commitment on a Instagram post. It was a pretty good commitment video, in my honest opinion. And I was like, I I was really excited for, I was like, where is she committing to? And at first, she had a jersey that said Beach on it. I'm like, Long Beach State? And then I realized, oh, wait, she plays club volleyball for Long Beach Mizuno. So overall, I think it is a great commitment Oklahoma has an underrated program. They're not really the most well-known when it comes to the Big 12, but obviously it's a good pickup. I think Oklahoma's going to get a great player. Like I said, great serve, heavy arm. I think she could be a good six-rotation player. So overall, I really think Mele Coral Blagojevich is going to do great things for the Sooners. It's going to be really interesting to see what Oklahoma can do, especially when they transition into the SEC. Because remember, Oklahoma and Texas are going to be in the SEC, which is going to be really interesting. Not just for football, but for volleyball as well. So I'm going to be interested in what can happen when it comes to that. So there's that right there. 
So to pretty much finish up on Coral Blagojevic as a player, I really think she has – she, she could do great things for the Sooners. Now, Oklahoma isn't really the best women's volleyball program. They have had their moments. They did do decently in the Big 12, but they're not on the level of Baylor and Texas. I'm not even sure if they're on the level of TCU, but with Mele Coral Blagojevich, I hope this does open the eyes of so many other players for them to possibly commit to Oklahoma and say, you know, Oklahoma has something good going on. They have that Mele Coral Blagojevich girl. I think maybe we should recruit to or commit to Oklahoma. That's just my little opinion. But overall, I'm really happy for Mele. I have seen her play in person, and I wish her nothing but the best. So congratulations to Mele Coral Blagojevich, and good luck in your up-and-coming 2023 high school volleyball season. So that is going to do it for that little high school girls volleyball news. We're going to take ourselves a quick little commercial breaky break. When we come back, we've got some AVP to recap. Then we have some NVA to recap. And then we have our IE Sports Radio What If Moment. Either way, keep it locked here on Set Point, here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. shores of the Puget Sound, to the rushing waters of the Columbia River, stretching across the Great Cascades, and on IE Sports Radio lives the Northwest Territory Sports Show, hosted by me, Brad Buckingham. On this show, I cover all the great collegiate and professional sports teams that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. Of course, I'm talking about the Seattle Seahawks, Seattle Mariners, Sounders, and even the Seattle Kraken. But I can't forget all of that is good in Oregon either. I got the Trailblazers, the Oregon Ducks, the Beavers, even the Timbers, and much, much more. You can listen to the show every Sunday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern, noon to 1 p.m. Pacific, on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. What is going on, everybody? My name is Harrison Glazer, and we're coming at you from the show that never sleeps podcast. I cover the Jets, the Islanders, the Nets, and the Yankees. This is Fia Moss, and I cover the Mets, Knicks, Rangers, and the Giants. Our show is live every Wednesday through Spreaker and a bunch of other ways to get our content. Again, we're the show that never sleeps podcast. We talk about all those New York sports. It's a lot of fun. We get into all of it. Please tune in. Again, that's Wednesdays at 6 p.m. And we look forward to having you guys right here on Night Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Sports fans, are you looking for the latest on Northern California sports? Then take a trip out west with me, your host, Gina G, on Reppin' the NorCal Sports, right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. I'll be bringing it to you all the way live every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And it's always a packed show. 
I'll bring you everything. Dynastic 49ers. The bite of the San Jose Sharks. Torture of the San Francisco Giants. The Golden State Warriors that we still believe. Then take you across the bay to the rise and grind of the Oakland A's. I've got you covered on college ball from the Cal Bears to the Stanford Cardinal so that no matter what, repping a NorCal sports is always repping the bay. So if you bleed red and gold or you're looking to keep an eye out west in them thar hills, don't miss me, Gina G, on repping a NorCal sports. Catch me every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, and I'll have your fandom repped harder than a trio of Defenders Garden Stephen Curry before his buzzer beater is Gucci. Sports fans, do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago, and you need to check out Chi Town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kernan, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks. Cubs, White Sox, we'll cover them all plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing, and we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Chi Town Weekly every week right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Segment number two of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all the sports. Forgot to mention that there's still some NBA action going on. Currently going on right now is the Los Angeles Blaze and the Orange County Stunners. The Stunners took the opening set. Unfortunately, I could I was unable to find the opening set. I do apologize as I'm going to try to it was 26-24. The, the Stunners won the first set. So the Stunners won the opening set 26-24. They are currently up 13-9. Shout out to Pittsburgh. In set two against the Los Angeles Blaze. This is the last match of the NBA Event 3 for this weekend. Or this week. And then after that, we don't have any more NBA action until late in June. No! <laughs> I got to go a week or two without talking some volleyball when it comes to the AVP and the NBA. Oh, I'm, I'm just being silly at this point. So, Stunners are up 13 to 10 in set two. So, we're actually going to jump on into my iSports Radio What If moment. So, iSports Radio this week is having a What If week, and everyone had a lot of great What Ifs when it came to their show. Adam had a plethora of what ifs when it came to the Chicago Bears, the Chicago Bulls, the Chicago Blackhawks, the Chicago Cubs, and the Chicago White Sox and whatnot. And his drop just played just recently. Definitely do check out Chi Town Weekly, which comes on an hour before this show. So for my what if moments when it comes to set point, when it comes to volleyball, there's not really a whole lot of what ifs. It's either it happened or it didn't happen, or it is what it is. Like, there is no no use crying over spilt milk. You just move on with it and just not complain. So, for starters, 
I actually reached out to my followers on Twitter saying what were some what if moments when it came when it came to volleyball. I told them to not include what if a certain player played for this school instead of that school. Like for example, what if Dana Retke committed to Texas or Nebraska instead of Wisconsin? Like that one's too easy for me. Like it's too easy to say that because you could say that about all of the NCAA college volleyball players. It's like you could say that so much about everyone. Like, what if Dana Retke played for Long Beach State? Or what if Sammy Bricio played for Long Beach State? Or what if she played for UCLA and not USC? Those are too easy for me. That's too easy. So here's my what ifs for for NCAA volleyball. So the big what if comes back to 2015. So 2015 was a great year in NCAA Volleyball. USC was the number one seed. They were the Copac 12 champion with Washington. And honestly, USC looked like they were going to be winning another championship with McKaylee. They had such a great team all, put all together. They had Sammy Bricio. I think they had a young Kalia Lanier. They had Brittany Abercrombie at the opposite position they had Elise Ruddens at the middle blocker like I said and I, th- I think I mentioned her Victoria Garrick a young Victoria Garrick as a serving specialist slash defensive specialist slash she might have been libero either way USC was just such a great team they didn't lose a match until the second half of conference play where they lost to Washington in straight sets on the road and then they lost in their second to last game of the season against UCLA, which was complete donkey do, which cost them the outright conference title. And then they eventually became co Pac 12 champions. So all was gravy for USC when it came to their regular season. Then it came the postseason. They managed to, they managed to get past their round of 62 or not 62, 64 matchup in four sets. Then they swept San Diego I think their first round opponent was Minnesota State. I'm not entirely sure. Either way, they took down some interesting team. They took down a team, which to me, I'm surprised they had to go four sets with. But either way, it was still a win. Then they swept San Diego in the round of 32. Then they beat Creighton in the round of 16 in four sets. Then came the Elite Eight where they played Kansas. Now, this was back when Kansas was fairly good. Not that I'm saying they're not good now, but this was when they were consistently good. So in their match against Kansas, they dropped the first two sets. And I'm like, oh, no, USC, what are you doing? Like, why are you going full football team mode? Like, this isn't – I'm like, stop, USC. Actually start to play volleyball. I don't want this season to end, please. Then they won the third and fourth set, and it looked as if USC had gotten on track. They eventually led, I want to say they led like 13 to 8 in set 5, and everyone's thinking, yes, USC's going to win. And then suddenly, 13 to 8 turned into 13 to 9, then 13 to 10, 13 to 11, 13 to 12. 13-13, and every USC fan is like, what is happening? This isn't isn't supposed to be USC. Then that 13-8 lead, remember that 13-8 lead that USC held in set 5? Vanished. Kansas led 14-13 in set 5, and then they eventually won 15-13 in set 5. So if you're keeping track, Kansas scored the last 7 points of the match and defeated the top seed USC in five sets. That right there was infuriating for all USC fans, and it just made everyone wonder, how did USC, with all that talent, not win? And many could beg the question, what if USC managed to win that match? Because in the Final Four, Kansas got whomped. Well, they didn't get whomped, but they lost to Nebraska, the eventual champion. Would USC put a bigger fight bigger and better fight against Nebraska. My answer to that would probably be possibly. Just because one of the Nebraska players, Justine Wong Orantes, the Olympian, she said she wanted to play USC. She did not want to play Kansas. She wanted to face Sammy Bricio, 
Brittany Abercrombie at least runs all those players. She did not want to face Kansas. She was so disappointed when she found out that Nebraska was going to play Kansas and not USC. And I was disappointed too. It really made me wonder what would have happened if USC had gotten out of the Elite Eight. Would they have gotten to the Final Four? And everything might have gone differently with Mick Haley. Mick Haley might have still had a job with USC. I'm not going to go into what happened with him because I actually don't know what happened with him. I just know that he was released and eventually hired for Brent Crouch and the rest is history. Either way, what could have happened if USC, what if USC got out of that Elite Eight matchup against Kansas? Would they have beaten Nebraska? That's just so much food for thought right there. And then the year after, USC actually went up to – actually, no, I think it was the year before. It was the year before where USC went up 2 nothing on Washington, and then they eventually lost in five sets. They got reverse swept, which was – very disappointing by USC, as this kind of makes me wonder, what if USC had beaten Washington and advanced to the Elite Eight, or not the Elite Eight, the Elite, the Final Four? I want to say that Penn State would have still beaten them, just because USC that year was one year away. Now, if they had 2015's team against Penn State's 2000. 14's team, I definitely think that USC's 2015 team would win. But honestly, it's it's just a big what if for USC, just because it really changed the dynamic and it might have actually saved Mick Haley's job. Not that I'm saying that Mick Haley doesn't deserve to be a head coach. It just makes me wonder what could have been, because now USC has gone through what? They went through Brent Crouch and now they're still at Brad Keller, which is still decent. Like, it used to be a consistent job being the USC women's volleyball coach, and now it's starting to become a merry-go-round. And at least I hope Brett, Brett, Coach Keller can continue to do big things for USC. But now it just makes me wonder, what if USC advanced to the Final Four back in 2015? That is my what if moment for iSports Radio. I have another what if moment. And this actually goes back to the spring of 2020, where. I'm sorry, not the spring of 2020. The spring of 2021, where it was the first round of the NCAA tournament. It was a shortened tournament. It was a round of 48 instead of a round of the traditional 64. And a lot of teams were left out uh, on the outside looking in, which was very disappointing. So this what-if moment is a big, 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 big what-if. And this actually comes at the hands of Rice Volleyball. So Rice Volleyball was one of the more underrated and underappreciated teams. They were the only team to hand Texas its only loss of the regular season and only loss in general. This made me wonder if any – what if – Rice was the only team that could beat Texas because Rice was practically the kryptonite when it came to Texas. And for me, this made me wonder, can Rice defeat Texas? So before so before Rice can, was able to get to Texas, they had to get past its first round matchup against Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And then they also had to get past Penn State, which most likely – then they also then they would have been able to play Texas. So overall, that's how Rice's path to the NCAA tournament would work if they won a rematch with Texas. Here's one problem: Rice never got to play its matchup against Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Why? Because Rice unfortunately had a positive COVID test, which unfortunately disqualified them from the tournament and it made enforced Texas A&M. Corpus Christi to advance. That was probably the most disheartening and heartbreaking moment when it came to a very promising program such as Rice Women's Volleyball. They had such a legit team. I really thought that that team, with a lot of returners from the previous year, a lot of talent, and a Conference USA title under its belt, would prove to be a great matchup for any team. I really think that this Rice team could have honestly gone 
to the Sweet 16 to get its little matchup against Texas. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case as Rice, unfortunately, developed COVID, which disqualified them, which forced them to go into its little COVID protocols, which I really was saddened about. I think everyone was sad that they found out that Rice women's volleyball was unfortunately unable to play in the NCAA tournament, which eventually Texas A&M Corpus Christi wound up getting stomped on by Penn State in the in the second round. And it's like, ugh. And then Penn State eventually lost to Texas. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So I just really wonder, what if Rice did not have that positive COVID test? Or what if the NCAA was more flexible when it came to COVID and whatnot? I know COVID was still a thing back in the spring of 2021. COVID wasn't going away. But honestly, what if the NCAA was more flexible when it came to when it came to COVID and possibly rescheduling matches and giving more teams certain days off? Like, it's just the biggest what if. Because Rice, I think, could have done so much damage at the NCAA tournament. And remember, that Penn State team that eventually lost in the Sweet 16, that was a young Penn State team. That was probably Russ Rose's youngest Penn State team he's ever coached. And unfortunately... We'll never get to see if Rice would have been able to topple that historic program. So it sucks, but it is what it is, and I get it. You have to keep the players safe, but it's just a heartbreaking and big what-if moment for me when it comes to the NCAA volleyball world. So that's just my little spiel right there. And then the biggest what-if for me is what if I didn't leave bases loaded? So – for I Sports Radio, we used to have the show called Bases Loaded, the baseball show. I was actually one of the co-hosts, and eventually I departed from Bases Loaded. I'm not going to get into why, but this kind of makes me wonder with I Sports Radio's What If Week. What if I never left Bases Loaded? What if I was still the co-host for Bases Loaded? What if I was still doing my thing when it came to our baseball show? Would I still? Would I have Set Point? Would I have SoCal Supreme Sports Show? That's just the biggest what if. And it makes me wonder, what if? What if I still had a baseball show here on iSports Radio? Not that I wouldn't want to trade set point for a baseball show, but honestly, it just makes me wonder, would I still have set point? But I guess we'll never know. But I'm happy with set point and SoCal Supreme Sports Show, and I hope to continue to grow set point and SoCal Supreme Sports Show more and more. All right, so that is it for my what-if moment, and I hope we can have more great what-if moments to come for the – more less what-if moments to come and lots of great moments for set point to come. So jumping back into the update of the Orange County Stunners and Los Angeles Blaze. So the Stunners are actually up 22-19. to 19. They, they were actually up by as many as I think six, maybe nine – Either way, the Stunners are closing in on winning set two, but boom goes a kill from the outside. They are at, from the Los Angeles Blaze. They're only down two, but I'm not going to get all into that. Gina says, you're doing amazing anyway, and she says, look at the progress you've made on set point. Yeah, I totally agree, and that's complete facts right there. So I guess things happen for a reason, but all bad things eventually lead to good things. So... Def, Gina definitely makes a good point on that, and it's one of those what if moments that will never be discovered, just will never be answered, just because it eventually turned out to being something good. So now let's jump on into the AVP. So the AVP had the New Orleans Open this past weekend, as the men and the women had their tournament in the Bayou. So start with the men, as the men won't. The men's tournament was won by Phil Dalhauser and Casey Patterson. They won the the, the final 17-21, 21-19, and 15-13 in the final. Honestly, to get to that point, Phil Dalhauser and Casey Patterson had to outlast a very talented Miles Partain and Paul Lottman team in the semifinals as – Phil Dalhauser and Casey Passion were actually down eight to five in set number three, 
And they eventually went on a 10-3 run to eventually take the third set 15-11. So I was quite impressed with Phil Dalhauser and Casey Patterson. They're really meshing well as a great pair. They're both really good beach volleyball players. Phil Dalhauser is very experienced, and Casey Patterson is experienced, and he has been bouncing around partner by partner by partner, and he is really adapting well with Phil Dalhauser, the slim beast. Also winning that first set was very crucial for Dalhauser and Patterson. They won it 23-21, to which that set could have gone either way. If they lose that set, then Partain and Lotman are feeling good about themselves, but they won that first set, and eventually that was the big difference maker. So tough one for, Ta- for Taylor Crabb and Taylor Sander, which lost in the final. They won their semifinal match against Troy Field and Chase Budinger in two sets, 21-25 and 23-21. So overall, it was a great tournament for the AVP New Orleans Open. I was quite impressed. I- I'm not surprised that Dalhauser and Patterson won. I really thought that that you know they were going to win it just because they're just so good, man. They're too good, man. They're really good. Even though Dalhauser and Patterson struggled in their first matchup, which was quite surprising. I was very surprised that Noah Dyer and Chase Frischman pushed Dalhauser and Patterson to the brink, but they were able to win that matchup in three sets. And then Dalhauser and Patterson didn't have to go three sets until the semifinals, and then they eventually went three sets in the final. So overall, I really think that Phil Dalhauser and Casey Patterson are doing great things, as this is their second AVP tournament they've won this season. And honestly, the sky's the limit for them if they continue to play this great. Jumping on over to the women's side of things, the women's side kind of had the same deal. It was basically the top overall seed versus the number two seed as the top overall seed included Kelly Cheng, a.k.a. Kelly Clace, and Betsy Flint, and the other finalists consisted of Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss. And in the end, Kelly Cheng and Betsy Flint came out on top, sweeping the final as I was quite surprised that Cheng and Flint was able to win the final that, I wouldn't say that easily, but they won in straight sets, 21-15, 21-15. And I, was, again, I was very surprised because I thought Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss had that momentum. I really thought they were going to be able to at least push it to a third set. But unfortunately, Clay... Chang and Flint were just too good, and there's a reason why they were the number one seed. Now, I was quite surprised that Chang and Flint went three sets with Brooke Bauer and Katie Horton, as the second set, or the first set, they lost 21 18, and then they won the next two 21 14, and then 15 12. And honestly, I was real impressed by Chang and Flint, as they actually won their first AVP, tur- AVP tournament of the season. Unfortunately, it's a tough loss for Cloth and Nuss as they lost their first final of the season, but they're still growing. They've got lots of time. They've won two tournaments this season, one coming from the AVP and one coming from the Challenge League outside of the AVP. So a few pairs I would like to highlight, starting off with Haley Harward and Emily Day. So I know Emily Day is a veteran, while Haley Harward has participated in a couple of AVP tournaments, But this was kind of her first tournament following her final match at USC when it came to beach volleyball. So overall, I was quite impressed with with those two. They made it all the way to the semifinals, only to lose to the eventual champion Kelly Cheng and Betsy Flint. But they also had to go through the elimination bracket as Harward and... Day lost to Tony Rodriguez and Savvy Simo in the first round. So for Haley Harward and Emily Day to make their way through the elimination bracket and get to the semifinals, it is a testament to their team chemistry and their bond with one another and their trust with one another. Speaking of Tony Rodriguez and Savvy Simo, they actually advanced to the winner's bracket quarterfinals where they eventually lost to Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss. That eventually knocked them into the loser's bracket final. 
unfortunately for them, in the winner's bracket quarterfinal, where they lost to Taron Cloth and Kristen Nuss, Tony Rodriguez did suffer an injury, which forced Savvy Simo and Tony Rodriguez to basically retire from the tournament. Not from the game, but from the tournament. They had to withdraw from the tournament, so they basically got DQ'd, which is very sad. I really feel bad for Tony Rodriguez. I really hope it's nothing too serious. I hope it's something that she can recover from and like get back onto the court for the next tournament. Because nothing is worse than participating in a tournament and then eventually finding out that you are no longer able to participate in the tournament due to the fact that you got injured. And it wasn't even all her fault. Like, honestly, I th- it things happen. Injuries happen in all sports. And I really feel heartbroken for Rodriguez and for Simo because they were doing so well until – they faced Cloth and Nuss, and then that injury happened, and then that eventually had them retiring from the tournament or just withdrawing from the tournament. So it eventually was a automatic win for Haley Harward and Emily Day, which was supposed to play Savvy Simo and Tony Rodriguez in the in one of the consolation or in the one of the loser bracket finals. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case because Rodriguez got injured. So, well wishes to Tony Rodriguez, and here's hoping that those two can. Here's hoping that Rodriguez and Simo can continue to do big things. As I was quite impressed with them. Outside of the loss in the quarterfinal, I was very impressed that Savvy Simo and Tony Rodriguez had a great tournament run. They were the 11 seed, and they upset the 3 seed, which was also Zana Muno and. Brandy Wilkerson, which, again, 11 seed upsetting the 6 seed and then eventually upsetting the 3 seed, that's quite impressive. This makes me really wonder what could have happened if Rodriguez did not get hurt. If Rodriguez didn't get hurt, I think this team could have done some major damage. I think they could have been in the semifinals, and who knows what they could have done to Kelly Clace, Chang, And Betsy Flint. I'm not trying to say that Cheng and Flint would have lost to Simo and Rodriguez. I'm just saying it's just another what if. What if Tony Rodriguez did not get hurt? So there's another what if to add to the what if pile when it comes to volleyball. So that is that for the AVP right there. It was a great little weekend when it came to that tournament. I wish the women's final would have been... I wouldn't say competitive, but I just wish it could have been a little bit more dramatic. But it's still a great tournament nonetheless. So the next AVP series will not be this weekend, but the following weekend. As the the AVP heads down to the Muskegon Open. As they'll be heading to the Great Lakes State. As they'll be heading to Western Michigan for the Muskegon Open. Which is going to be really awesome. The prize will be $50,000, and it'll be 25000 per gender, which is good because of equal pay and whatnot. We do not know the schedule just yet, which makes me sad face, so we'll probably know the schedule next week, so I'll probably be previewing that. I'll probably have a good full-on in-depth interview, or not interview, uh, full-depth preview of the Muskegon Open. Maybe not, not next week, but the following week. If that makes any sense. Oh, no, no, no. It would be next week because that would be the weekend of 11th and the uh, 11th and 10th. So overall, or the 11th and the 12th. So overall, I can't wait to have this Muskegon open. It's going to be great and it'll give me some material to talk about. It'll give me nice, the preview will be a good little material so I don't have to like miss set point, which I'm trying not to do. But after the Muskegon Open, there's not going to be another AVP event until the Denver Open, where the AVP hits the road to the Rocky Mountains of Colorado on July 2nd and 3rd, which is the day before 4th of July, which is quite nice. Not bad. Not bad at all. So, not going to look too far ahead on that, but that's the the next AVP event following the Muskegon Open. So, there's that. So that is that for the AVP right there. Let's jump on back into some 
NVA action as let's head back into the Orange County Stunners versus LA Blaze match as the Orange County Stunners took set number two, 25 23. So the Los Santos Blaze are battling. Unfortunately, the Stunners, being the very talented team that they are, they're just showing them who's in charge. As the Stunners lead, or no, this this match is tied four to four in set number three. The Stunners lead the match two nothing, just because they're the Orange County Stunners and they're just that good. The Stunners also defeated drawing a blank on who they actually faced, which is actually perfect segue to go into the final topic of the day, the NVA. So we'll start. We'll take it from the top. So take it from the top, starting on. Saturday, so everything got messed up. Everyone thought that the matches started on Friday, but then the NVA decided to push it back to Saturday, then on Sunday, then Monday, just because I think flights were an issue, and I think they just wanted to have the three-day weekend to have volleyball, even though I don't think it's wise to have volleyball on Memorial Day, just because it's a national holiday in my opinion, but I digress. So, jumping on into the first day of event number three. So, Inland Empire Matadors versus the Utah Sting. The Utah Stingers. Matadors took the first set, which was quite surprising. But then the Stingers kind of spread their wings and took the next three sets, winning the match 3-1 against the Matadors. Stingers improved to 3-2, and two, while the Matadors dropped to 1-4. and four. Tough season for the Matadors, but here's hoping that they can finally... Here's hoping they can eventually turn it around. Then we had the match of the week. New Jersey Freedom versus the Texas Tyrants. I will say this. The New Jersey Freedom is no longer known as Team Freedom. They're now known as the New Jersey Freedom because they rebranded. This was courtesy of Nick England of the NVA. He actually replied to my comment. I was like, so is New Jer- is Team Freedom New Jersey Freedom or are they still Team Freedom? And he said, everyone rebranded. So it's like, now Team Freedom is New Jersey Freedom. And then also, I got another reply from one of the other commentators from from the NVA. I think his name was Ira. Ira something. I, I can't believe I'm, bl- I'm uh, blanking on his name. But either way, one of the other NVA commentators replied to one of my comments. He said... Ira Thor, he said, he said, the Inland Empire Matadors rebranded, so the then, so they're no longer known as the Ontario Matadors, they're now known as the Inland Empire Matadors, so they were answering my questions in the live stream chat, which was very nice. I'm, I'm glad to be in the loop of things, just so I'm not assuming. I did hear that those teams did rebrand. It's just that they need – those teams need to, like, update their freaking biography. I can't, I'm sick of seeing Team Freedom. It's New Jersey Freedom. It's Inland Empire Matadors. Update your Twitter. Update your Instagram. Update your team website. Update everything. <sighs> okay. I had to get that off my chest. Anyway, back to New Jersey Freedom versus Texas Tyrants. So through three sets, Texas Tyrants led 2-1 in the match, and the Tyrants actually had two match points. But to the very great credit of the Freedom, they did not give up. They eventually dodged those two match points. They eventually took the fourth set. And then the fifth set, the team, or the New Jersey Freedom were just rolling as... Joe Norman, or as many people like to call him, Joe Normus, had himself a monster game. He helped carry the Freedom to a five-set win over the Texas Tyrants as the Freedom hand the Tyrants their first loss of the season. New Jersey improves to 5-0, and oh, which is quite impressive. I don't think anyone predicted the Freedom being the only undefeated team in the NBA. Next matchup was Las Vegas Ramblers versus Los Angeles Blaze. The Blazers are having a much improved season from last year. Have, however, the Ramblers were just too much for them. They had the strong arm of Brandon Rattray, the strong arm of Jordan Hoppy. Eventually, it was a sweep for the Las Vegas Ramblers as they just showed no mercy against the Blaze. And then the last matchup of the May, the May 29th match, 
the May 28th matchups. We had the Orange County Stunners taking on the Colorado Kraken. The Kraken took the first set. However, the Stunners, being the very talented team, they were reverse or not reverse swept them. Gentlemen swept them as they took the second, third, and fourth set. Some of the sets were relatively close. I think the third set was decided by three points. But either way, the Stunners were not getting stunned today. They beat the Kraken 3-1. Jumping on into Sunday's matchups, we had the Utah Stingers taking on the New Jersey Freedom. The Stingers looking to cap off the 2-0 record this past weekend, while the Freedom still coming off of that five-set win over Texas, trying to improve to 6-0. Easy money for Team Freedom as Joe Norman had himself another big game. He wheeled the Freedom to the victory. And look at the New Jersey Freedom. 6-0, only undefeated team in the NBA. They really, really have been showing everybody what's up. And they're showing that Jersey grit. Let me just say. And that Jersey grit is a real thing. I even said that in the live chat and... Ira Thor said, that jersey grit is real. (laughs) So, good humor right there. And once again, it's another nice little reply. Then we had, following the Freedom versus Stingers matchup, the Texas Tyrants taking on the Inland Empire Matadors. Tyrants coming off of a loss to the Freedom while the Matadors trying to ship ship shape their season around. They took the first at 25-23. The Matadors had so many opportunities to try to get back in set number two. Unfortunately, Texas pulled out the close 25-22 second set win. And then the third and fourth set just went to Texas as Texas won those two sets. And they eventually won the match 3-1. Texas did not have their starting libero, Jose Malero. But he should be back by the time the next event begins as Texas improves to 5-1. and one, The second best record in the NBA Jumping over to the next matchup, we have Southern Exposure versus the Dallas Tornadoes. This was a great matchup. This was a great matchup courtesy of Felix Chapman. He was Superman as he practically carried Dallas throughout most of the way. This was the battle of Southern Exposure trying to get back on track while Dallas Tornadoes trying to keep up with the Utah Stingers. Eventually, Dallas pulled out the close five-set victory over Southern Exposure. Another tough loss for Southern Exposure as they lost another Yet another five-set match while Felix Chapman had himself a monster game. He was dealing service aces. He was just getting kill after kill after kill. And he was just getting blocks at the net. He was just unstoppable. Just absolutely a beast. Some are even calling him the new face of the NVA. I wouldn't go that far, but honestly, absolutely amazing performance from Felix Chapman. And then the last match of the night was the battle of two winless teams. Seattle Sasquatch versus Chicago Untouchables. The Untouchables trying to get back on track after having such rotten luck in their first four games. Sasquatch trying to earn their first victory of the season. Untouchables just straight up dominated this matchup. They didn't even allow the Sasquatch to cross 20 points once. As the Untouchables looked like they had their full team for the first time this season. As they straight up dominated and won the match in three sets. Ending day number two of event number three. Jumping on over into today's matchups. We had the Chicago Untouchables taking on Southern Exposure. The Untouchables took the first set after their mat- their first match won against Seattle from the previous day. It looked as if the Untouchables were getting back on track. But remember, this is the OG Southern Exposure. They are also an OG team. They were not going to roll over and play dead. They won the next three sets. They eventually halted that three-match losing streak by winning in four sets over Chicago. They improved to two and four on the season. Chicago, one and five. Adam actually asked a question early on in the show as he asks, what do the Untouchables need to do to improve? They have to pass better, they have to serve tough, and they have to not relinquish leads, and they have to just do all the simple things correct. And they have to control what their side of the net has to offer. (laughs) Jumping on over to the second matchup of today, we had the Dallas Tornadoes versus the the Seattle Sasquatch. Now on paper, this looked like a mismatch, as Dallas Tornadoes come off of a huge win over Southern Exposure, but they did not have Felix Chapman, but that did not deter them as they took the first set 25-15. 
The Sasquatch showed some showed some grit as well as they took the second set, 25-22. Third set, Dallas was able to come back, win that third set. I want to say it was like 25-22 as well. They were up 2-1 in the match, but here came the Sasquatch ready to tie it up and force the fifth set as they won that fifth set, 25-16. to And then in the fifth set... Seattle just had just a lot of momentum. They were just they steamrolled their way through the first half of the fir- of the fifth set. They practically dominated that first first half of the fifth set. They were up eleven to three at one point in the fifth set, and I'm like, oh my god, where was the Seattle team in the past? <laughs> and it looked as if Seattle was going to cruise their way to a victory, but then Dallas was able to string together a few runs of their own. They scored three unanswered after trailing 14-6 to six, as they trailed 14-9. to nine. But That would be as close as they would get as a hitting error into the net gave Seattle their first ever NBA victory. They won the match in five sets, Cinco sets, as the Sasquatch. Congratulations, Seattle Sasquatch. You officially have an NBA victory. We are so proud of you, and there's not going to be any NVA teams going winless. So we can all put away the memes of this team going winless. They're not going to be the Detroit Lions or any of that sort. Jumping into the third matchup of today, we had – this was a thrilling matchup. Colorado Kraken versus the Las Vegas Ramblers. Another on-paper matchup that looks like the Vegas Ramblers are going to dominate. First set, the Ramblers won 25-22, but then the second set, the Kraken won won that second set, and then the third set, I think it was also 25-22, and then the Kraken won the third set, 25-20, and just like that, it looked as if Colorado was going to put the Vegas Ramblers, one of the top teams in the NVA, the OG teams in the NVA, on upset alert. Fourth set, the match, it was just all Vegas. Vegas steamrolled their way. I should also make note that the Vegas Ramblers did not have Brandon Rattray in this match. He had a sore elbow, so he was not available for this match. Regardless, the Ramblers took the fourth set, 25-16. Now in set five, the Kraken actually got off to a hot start. It wasn't as hot of a start as Seattle's hot start against Dallas, but they eventually led 10-5. to And everyone's thinking, okay, well, Colorado's going to close this one out, right? Oh, they should have realized who they were playing. They were playing the Las Vegas Ramblers. The Ramblers do not quit that easily, despite not having Brandon Rattray. As the Ramblers went on a 7-2 run to turn that 10-5 deficit into a 12-12 tie, Colorado then scored the next point to make it 13-12, but that was the last point they would ever score in the match as... Las Vegas scored the next three points, and they got and they won the match off of an ace from Jordan Hoppy. It was originally ruled out, but then the Ramblers had a challenge to use, and it looked as if the and the ball definitely kissed and barely kissed the service the service end line, which is definitely ruled in. And just like that, Las Vegas avoided the upset and managed to win, moving themselves to five and one on the season. The Kraken, on the other hand, they moved to 2-4, and four, which is a heartbreaking loss. That would have been a huge, 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 huge win for the Kraken, especially since they're a first-year program. It would have been so big right there. Unfortunately, that was not the case. So going back to the matchup between the Orange County Stunners and the Los Angeles Blaze, the Blaze lead 18-14 to 14 in set number three. The Stunners still lead the match 2-0, as that is pretty much your NVA volleyball update right there. So I can already tell you the Vegas Ramblers are just steamrolling their way in their division. They are 5-1. and one. The next team that is close to them is Southern Exposure, which is 2-4, and four, while the Matadors are 1-5. and five. I'm sorry, Larry. And then also the Chicago – or not, not the Chicago Untouchables. The New Jersey Freedom are perfect 6-0 and in their division. The Stunners are 3-2 and pending the end result of this match. But it looks like this Stunners versus Blaze matchup is going to go four sets as the Blaze are up 19-14 in set three. The Untouchables are 1-5 and on the season, which is unfortunate for them. So 
there is that right that there's that unfortunate matchup right there. So cheer up everybody cheer up Chicago fans. You still have the White Sox to cheer for. This is the national comp this is the national division. So and the uh American Coastal Division was the Ramblers' exposure in Matadors' division. So in the American Coastal Division, Ramblers, Ramblers are five and one. Exposure is two and four. Matadors and one and five. While the National Coastal Division consists of te- New Jersey Freedom being six and zero, oh, Orange County Stunners being three and two, and the Seattle Sasquatch being one and five. Then the National Central division we have the texas tyrants being at five and one the la blaze being at three and two depending on what happens in their final matchup and the chicago untouchables being one and five and then lastly in the american central division this is the division that is wide open the colorado kraken are bringing up the rear at two and four while the dallas tornadoes and the utah stingers are tied up at three and three in the division a lot could happen in the up and coming weeks. We are halfway through the NVA season. Can you believe that? We are halfway through the 2022 NVA season. It's only a matter of time before we get the playoffs happening in in the month of August, which is going to be fun times. As we're also going to get NCAA women's volleyball season about to be starting up momentarily. We get college football starting up, even though this is the show of NCAA and all things volleyball. But either way, that is pretty much your NVA update right there. Currently, right now, the Blaze are up 21-15 to 15 in set three. So I'm pretty sure that match is going to be going four sets. But that is going to do it for this week's episode of Set Point. You already know what time it is, ladies and gentlemen. It is time to drop that beat. Because I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Set Point. I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you all for tuning in. I really do appreciate your support. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen to the wee hours of the morning, I appreciate you. If you listen at any time, any place, anywhere, I appreciate you. Big shout out to the chat room for tuning in. Big shout out to Larry D. He said, Darren's the man, LOL. I I need to send you here, Tim and Will, when I'm talking about the updates of all your all the team's identities from the NBA. I appreciate that, Tina. Also, a big shout-out to Adam Karnick and Davidson Crooks and Pierre Moss, as well as Andrew Hagenbaum for tuning in. I really do appreciate you tuning in. And also, shout-out to Patty Bax, who will probably tuned in. Her support does not go unnoticed. Tina says, amazing show, Taryn. Glad I tuned in. And she's the best level show on the planet. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. For everyone here at iSports Radio, this is Karen Rodriguez signing off. You all have yourselves a great rest of the week. Once again, thank you to all of our veterans. Happy Memorial Day. Thank you to everyone that served. Thank you for everyone that made the sacrifice for helping keep this country together. I will see you all Friday for the show Council the Sports Show. Until then, enjoy the last few, enjoy the last match of the NBA. This match is pretty. Obviously, one of the way of the Los Angeles plays up 22 to 15. I will see you all Friday for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. But until then, have a great rest of the week. I will see you all Friday. Be kind to one another. Be good. And don't be a dumb one. Peace!